Hello and welcome to Awesome Astronomy, episode 90, part 2 for December 2019. I know we said we'd only be bringing you one show this month, but we can't do that to you. So we've got a roundup of the advances this year in crewed spaceflight, which has truly crept up on us all. Some astronomy news showing that one fabled Star Wars science fail isn't a fail after all. A discussion about exoplanet habitability, and Jen sits down for a chat with Dr. Phil Sutton from Cardiff University. So Paul... Tell me about crewed space missions. Um, so we're approaching 2020, which means it's once again Mars time um, as we come towards opposition. Um, NASA is trying to name its 2020 rover. That's that's happening at the moment because, let's face it, Mars 2020 is a rubbish name. ESA um, <laughs> is still trying to resolve those parachute issues with the Rosalind Franklin. Um, ground tests, though, seem to have gone well. Um, they haven't torn this time. Mm. It's always good when a parachute doesn't tear. Um, but yep. Yep. we're awaiting the airdrop tests. They're about to happen. So if we have a failure, there is actually a very high chance that the, the Franklin will remain earthbound until the next opposition, of course, 2022. Uh. And with all the attendant issues around funding, keeping the vehicle in good shape, launch slots, da 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 you know, there's actually a good chance of cancellation. So oh definitely one will mm. follow up um, in the new year hopefully with good news but mm. that that we wait and see next up we have commercial crew news and this time not spacex yes boeing they of the slightly buggered airliners fame the mm. cst 100 starliner um is readying <laughs> for its test launch as we speak in fact it was mated to the atlas 5 booster just a couple of days ago now this is despite an eyebrow raising abort test at the start of november where all went well with the exception of the parachute deployment uh mm. only two of the three deployed mm. now the landing was deemed safe in a sense this is one of those reasons for multiple shoots uh the ship should survive when all doesn't quite work perfectly but nonetheless it was an uncomfortable issue for a company that is frankly mired in issues with the 737 max the united states air force's new tanker aircraft nasa's sls and of course the long delays of the cst itself mm -hmm. now this mm -hmm. has been raised in the office of the inspector general's report um, on commercial crew that was released in the middle of november and it was pretty damning of the value of for money that boeing is providing given that they had the larger com crew contract the report highlights that CST will cost NASA $90 million per seat to the ISS, Whoa. which is both $5 million more than they paid to Russia for a seat on Soyuz and a whopping $35 million more per seat than SpaceX and their Dragon wow. 2 capsule. Wow. Yeah. That is huge difference. Exactly. Now, Boeing have attacked this report and strongly disputed the findings, pointing to the fact that the CST is a fresh design whereas Dragon 2 is called that for a reason, um, and that the costs don't take into account the cargo that will also be carried by the CST, and that, that will sort of spread the costs. But, you know, smoke and fire and all that. Anyway. Well, it's not it's not disputing it then, really, is no. it? It's just saying, oh, well, uh, uh, yeah, yes, but... Exactly, mm. exactly. So, December 17th may well be a corner-turning moment for Boeing and the whole commercial crew endeavour. A successful launch, docking and return, will hopefully help set up a crewed launch in the first half of next year. And with SpaceX seeming to resolve the Dragon capsule issues, the big explosion we had earlier in the year, it appears we may be safe in saying, finally, and how many times have we said this, that we should see the return of crewed launch to US soil in the next few months. <laughs> I feel like we've been saying that for years. But I, I do feel like actually we're there. I think I think it's we're there now. We've got two capsules on on rockets and yeah, if that if that one works, then it's gonna happen next year. It's it's got to. And Orion. Yeah, exactly. It's gonna happen. It's gonna happen. So sticking to a sort of so, um, put teeth back in. Sticking to a similar theme, Sierra Nevada Corporation, which, to put my cards on the table, should have been the commercial crew contract right at the start, <laughs> has been going great guns with their Dream Chaser shuttle, um, have now announced that they have developed a cargo module to attach to the rear of the craft to carry an additional one and a half tonnes of cargo. Uh, oh, if you're a student nice. of space history, then this will be giving a European space agency Hermes vibe. Um, because as with Hermes, this module will not return, it will burn up on re-entry, thus its name, Shooting Star. This means that in a single vehicle, you have two cargo spaces, one that will return to Earth and another for disposal. 
Um, they have six missions to the ISS lined up for 2024, and the first one is due in just over a year. No parachute required. Uh, uh, sneaking under the radar, that it, one, because they don't do a lot of press like a lot of exactly. other uh, companies involved in this, mm. but... They're slowly and surely getting there, aren't and, they? And you know what? They haven't had the big crew, uh, commercial, you know, the crew commercial contract that the others had. They've developed this a lot off their own back. They've now picked up the NASA cargo contract, so they've got the input of funds, and it's going great guns because, of course, it's an aircraft. Yeah, it doesn't require parachutes, and a, a, it, it's you know, yeah. ultimately, it, it's a better return system. So, it, it, if your thermal tiles work, precisely. It's a it's it's a better system in many areas. Exactly, exactly. How much is going on at the moment? Lots. Oh, honestly, it's overwhelming trying to keep track of everything. Yeah, 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 yeah. We we have we have hit that. It's not a new space race. I I don't I don't go with that as such. But we we've hit that this new new age of space. It it's. There are so many different players involved, and so many different yeah. boosters and and capsules, and ah, it's just it's just great. There's there's so much going on. Yeah. It's amazing. America, Britain, New Zealand, India, and China, and China. All of these all of these nations aren't doing it to be the no. first on the first back on the moon or for for glory stuff. It's because there's money in this because oh, yeah. you know you advance your technology. You build up your engineering base within that country, and the the knock on benefits and, are just huge, and and the money that. You and can I make could have too. I could have mentioned um, a, an Egyptian satellite launch this this month. I could last. Um, I could have mentioned um, this stuff with uh, Israel again. There's stuff uh, with the satellites of South Korea. There's there, there's just so much going on. There, there's just just there's even stuff in Africa. There's Nigeria satellite. There's uh, oh god, it, it, it's, it's all over the place. You just you, you have to be so selective when you make this news because there is yeah. just so much going on yeah yeah so the the big news story that i've picked out for this month is uh, going back to astronomy rather than space exploration because um there's a suggestion that there that tatooine like systems uh, from the star wars franchise might not be anywhere near as rare as um as we might have originally thought and this is based on um, data from Kepler and Gaia because with 200 to 400 billion stars in our galaxy both of those spacecraft um, NASA's Kepler spacecraft which is looking at uh, stars for exoplanets around them and Gaia which is ESA's mm. astrometry um, spacecraft both suggest that up to or rather combining the data it suggests that up to 85% of stars in the Milky Way are in multiple star systems like Tatooine and Kepler data shows that a third of those multiple star systems have planets around them. And these are not just more prevalent than we'd expect, but also really interesting for astronomers because we don't yet know how a star system with two or more suns affects the emergence and the eventual fate of those planets in orbit around them. But it really does show that, you know, with a third of 85% of the stars in the Milky Way having planets around them and being multiple star systems, Tatooine is almost more prevalent. No, it is more prevalent, isn't it? Mm. It it is fascinating, isn't it? Um, because you think that you know when when that we you know, Tatooine we, we nineteen seventy seven that film came out and what you they were trying to do was create this sort of image of an alien world. Yeah, you know, that and the, uh, what could be more alien than having more than one sun in the sky? Yeah. Turns out, not that alien. Turns out, it's not that unusual. <laughs> you know, the, isn't that amazing that here we are, sort of mm. 42 years later, and actually what the science has shown is that's probably quite common. I mean, I think I'm pretty goes, sure... Sorry, Jen. I was just going to say, I think it just goes to show how... I mean, when we first started looking for exoplanets, we were not very much under the assumption that, oh, yeah... You know, all the solar systems will be like our solar system, mm. and then suddenly we found all these hot Jupiters, which we mm. don't have in our solar system. We were like, "Ah, well, all right, that that's a bit different. How do we explain that?" And we sort of just about get around to mostly figuring out how you might get hot Jupiters, and you know, then they find planets which are all clustered together right close to their star, and then they find um, systems that have you know planets on orbits 
you know, many thousands of astronomical units, which is the distance between the Earth and the Sun. And, and now we've got these planets orbiting, you know, two stars, and there are, you know, a great proportion of them are in those sort of systems. And it just makes you realise that actually our solar system is probably pretty rare. And well, it certainly seems like that from what we've seen already, doesn't yeah. it? We've not seen anything like this solar system before. Yeah, and, and it's that um, weak anthropic um, argument, isn't it, about sort of you know, yeah. how did life yeah. occur on Earth in, in the way that it does, and how you know how's intelligent life come about? And it's that sort of we're here because we're here, because we're here argument. Yeah, you know, <laughs> the, I mean, there is the argument for exoplanets that there are selection effects, right? Yeah. That there oh, are yeah. things that we can't see yet, but even so, we're finding things which are even weird when you factor that in. Yeah, and and we've got what four thousand exoplanets roughly now that are confirmed. Yeah. So, you know, we we've got actually a pretty good sort of data set now. It, it's not like we're back in the early days of exoplanets, where it's, you know just a few hundred confirmed, and we might actually we've got four thousand confirmed and loads more that are probable. So the data set yeah. is getting pretty large. And it, it is fascinating that actually it does appear the solar system, our one, it is is actually quite odd. It's unusual. Yeah. It's not it's not what normally happens. Yeah. It, it would point to what happens on Earth as actually not necessarily being that common. Um and then by common I mean you know, it, it it's not gonna be your your Star Trek, Star Wars thing of an intelligent life form, and you know, in every star system or every few star systems, it just isn't going to happen. Uh, because actually, these multiple star systems, well, it would suggest that would make life harder. Yeah. Well, this is the thing because how are you going to get orbits that are stable enough mm. over an extended period of time for life to arise? Because I imagine that. You know the the orbits are going to be unless you know for for the stars orbiting anywhere near where the habitable zones might be if the habitable zones even exist around double stars double stars rubbish if the habitable zones even exist around binary systems like how how long is a planet going to be able to stay in in what you would deem to be the habitable zone is it always going to be changing because you know you you've got the two stars and how are the orbits mm -hmm. ah it's mind boggling yeah well i think it was accepted wisdom until you know a few years ago that you couldn't have a, a planetary system like mm. tatooine uh, or you couldn't have life on it because it would be too unstable and where is your habitable zone how can it be habitable when you've got two stars um, affecting habitability in different patches that are overlapping in orbit in an orbiting yeah. system like that, you can't have somewhere that's going to be temperate all the time. And um, especially if the two stars are wildly different. Yeah, yeah. Well, exactly. I mean, it's interesting. The the looking looking through the the information, they're, they're saying that um, you know the the companion stars. Some are uh, they're looking at systems that where the stars are just twenty AU away. Oh wow. Mm. Which is which is nothing. I mean, that's that's yeah. you know that's what's that? That's um, it's Uranus. You know, yeah. that's the sun to Uranus. Yeah. So if you've got two two stars, even if they're just sun-like stars, they're just twenty. You know, life on Earth wouldn't work. No, it, 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 it's. I mean, twenty AU is you know, it's a long way out. But that means you know you've got another star just nineteen AU away, pumping out light and heat. And you know, that, that that's you know it's it's just not going to work. And there was also looking at systems that have go out to nine thousand AU. Oh right. So if you've got a, a small star like a red dwarf or a you know a sunlight, actually, a solar system that like, could be all right. Yeah, a solar system like like ours probably still would work with a, a small companion star right out at nine thousand AU, especially if it's like a you know a red dwarf or something. That's just going to be like having a you know a big planet out on the edge of the you know the kind of way out on the solar system and you think you know yeah you would struggle to sort of you know, a very small star you, you you wouldn't notice it necessarily particularly bright in the star in the sky either actually um no it, it would look it'd be one of the brightest stars but it wouldn't look particularly special necessarily um but they're saying the most frequent um apparently is a thousand au but that's still a long way out yeah so it's, but is it far enough away yeah I think it depends on the star. 
and especially if you've got these two stars and there are any kind of you know orc cloud things or asteroid mm. belts and are they going to be constantly di- you know disturbing material and chucking it in to, it constantly bombarded the yeah, yeah yeah we think you've got that aspect of it as well yeah um but if it depends on the stars as well because of course if if you're talking about like, as i say like a sun like star and a and a red dwarf then actually a thousand AUs again uh, you know there, there's there's possibilities there but if you're talking much larger stars, mm. then no, I mean, you know, you, you, it's going to be different. It, it's fascinating, though, because I, I remember talking on this show a few years ago where I think, you know, the first system like this was found. And the sort of utter surprise that, look at this, there are planets around a multiple star system. Yeah. And the, the, yeah. I remember we, mm. we, it was a news item and we, it, was, it was like a headline. And we're like, wow, look yeah. at this. It, you know, it's actually, mm. and now we're just like, Aff turns out they're pretty common <laughs> so yeah it's, it's not unusual it's actually we're the odd ones yeah, yeah. A, a third of most systems yeah. a third of most binary systems anyway. yeah it, it is bizarre um yeah but it, it's i mean it's that that thing in a way it's that thing we always knew wasn't it i remember as a as a kid growing up we knew that there would be planets around other stars we just we just yeah. knew there would and that they yeah. were probably quite common. And what this shows you... It's exactly the same situation as we know there's life out there somewhere. It's, it's around somewhere. In the same way that we knew there were planets out there. Yeah. There must be. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We don't, we don't know until we find it, but in the balance of probability, there must be. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But yeah, this is fascinating. So, you know, in, in the balance of probability, there is a planet like Tatooine and, um, with exactly the same yeah. stars, and it's a desert, and there's some people with water extractors. <laughs> Yeah. Yep. It's out there somewhere. <laughs> yep. Hello, listeners of Awesome Astronomy. Well, here it is, as I promised. Today, we have an interview with none other than Dr. Phil Segan, who is a researcher at Cardiff University. He's also my friend, which is nice. So it's nice to interview a friend for once, although I might make it slightly weirder. Yeah, I don't know. I, you're making <laughs> me feel like I'm more famous than I am, but, it, but it's a good thing. It's, it's, well, I it's don't nice. know. I think you are a little bit famous at the minute because the work that you've done recently with um, Supernova 1987A is all over the news. I mean, it is everywhere. Because did Cardiff do the first press release and then it just got picked up from there? Yep, that's exactly right. Uh, it kind of blew us all away, but we... Um, asked our communications officer if they'd be willing to do a press release for the university through the university's channels just you know let people at the university know what kind of great work we're doing Um, and thankfully he has some wonderful contacts in the media and offered the story to the BBC the BBC picked it up and uh, from there it just kind of exploded (laughs) appropriate for uh, yeah supernova Um, no it's been great it's been really wonderful so what is this story that's exploded tell us Tell us all about it. We'll go from the beginning. Okay. 1987A is a supernova explosion, but what does that mean? Right. So a supernova is what happens when you have a star that's much more massive than our own sun, uh, usually about eight times the size of our own sun or, or larger. Uh, when it goes through its life burning hydrogen in its core, um, at, at a certain point it will run out of hydrogen to burn in its core and gravity will make it collapse down farther, and there's a few other things I'll skip over, but uh, for very massive stars, they will explode in, in a really you know, catastrophic, cataclysmic event, and the, the, they're some of the most extreme events that we know of in the universe. When they do finally go boom, they can actually <laughs> outshine all the other stars in a galaxy very, very briefly for a short amount of time. That's amazing. Uh, yeah. Uh, so they're, they're really quite spectacular events. And they leave behind a lot of cool stuff, too. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's almost... I guess you can then reverse engineer things that you find in the explosion to tell you about the star and things like that, right? Yeah, that's right. Um, it, it's kind of hard with most of the supernovas that, that we look at just because most of them that we see are in other galaxies you know, very far away and you can't actually resolve uh, the detail. Supernova 1987A is uh, quite unique in this aspect in that it's actually so close by that we can resolve the little bits you know, inside of it, in the heart of the system, with something like a, the Hubble Space Telescope or ALMA, the telescope that we use for this study. And that's because 1987A is in the Large Magellanic Cloud, right? So that's it's one, right. That's one of the satellite galaxies of our own galaxy. So it was still in a separate galaxy. Yes. But 
pretty much as close as you can get when yes. it comes to other galaxies. Yes, it's just a stone's throw away in terms of astronomical scales. It's not mm. the closest galaxy to the Milky Way. I think there's two others. Um, the, uh, Sagittari know. the Sagittarius Dwarf Elliptical Galaxy, I think, and the Aquarius Dwarf are a little bit closer, but the Large Magellanic Cloud is closer than the Andromeda Galaxy, which is the yeah. nearest probably big spiral-type galaxy. When you think big, majestic spiral arm mm. galaxy, that would be the most uh, the, the closest of that type. But uh, yeah, the, the LMC, as we, we like, love to call it, the Large Magellanic Cloud, it's about uh, 50 kiloparsecs away. Um, so uh, just give it, put that in perspective. If you were traveling at the speed of your average jumbo jet, it would take <laughs> you, uh, you know, many billions of years to get there. Um, so it is quite far in terms of human Earth scales, but uh, very close for us. But in terms of yeah, in terms of the cosmos, it's yeah. basically on our doorstep, and it's naked eye visible. It was yeah. If you're in the southern oh, hemisphere, yeah. the large Magellanic Cloud was, but yeah, indeed, even yeah. even supernova 1987A oh, was, was it? naked eye visible for for oh, quite a while wow. after it went off. But you had to be in the southern hemisphere yeah, to see it. Yeah, of course, that would have been great. Mm -hmm. Wish I'd seen that. So you didn't study 1987A with your eyes. I mean, it would be wonderful nope. if you could have studied it with your eyes, but um, you know, by the time you've come to study it, it's faded, and the things that you're interested in are not really visible with your eye anyway. So what did you use to study 1987A? Yep, uh, so for this study, we used a telescope in the Chilean high desert called ALMA. It's uh, an array of 66 different antennas that, that uh, can take light in the infrared and submillimeter part of the spectrum. Uh, so uh, the reason why we do this is because you know, you're probably familiar with the beautiful Hubble images of uh, you know, uh, galaxies and, and other types of astrophysical phenomenon, but um, what Hubble sees is the optical light that comes from these objects. So that's more or less what your eyes would see. They, they mm. push into the ultraviolet and the infrared a little bit. Yeah. But um, uh, if you think of like, you know, some of these beautiful Hubble images of galaxies and things, you can sometimes see these dark dust lanes where, where the, the dust is absorbing the light of the, of the bright stuff behind it. Um, but if you go into the, the longer wavelength part of the spectrum, like the submillimeter, uh, then in, the, in those parts of the spectrum, the dust actually shines in emission. Uh, so it's actually this, the same reason why night vision cameras work. Uh, mm. night vision goggles work. So your body is producing heat. Uh, if you've ever ha been stuck in an elevator with, you know, 100 people, uh, you, you know, that feeling, you know, it gets quite, quite toasty. Um, so your, your body is producing heat. And that heat, um, you can actually see the light from that if you mm -hmm. go to slightly longer wavelengths, uh, so in the infrared. It's also the same thing if you have one of those old school uh, uh, coils on your stove. You know, mm -hmm. as it's cool, it just kind of looks dull, whatever, metallic. And then as you raise the temperature, it slowly gets, you know, this dull red, starts to glow, you know, orange and white if it's yeah. super hot. Um, it's the same same physical phenomenon. It's just now we're looking at much colder temperatures. Yeah. So what we're looking at is, is dust that's been produced in the heart of the supernova. Um, uh, and it's actually, in the current stage, it, it's at a temperature of something like 20 to 30 Kelvin. So that's hundreds of degrees below zero centigrade. Yeah. Now these guys know how important dust is because I bang on about it all the time. Any opportunity, I'm like, no, but well, why? Where's the dust? Why aren't they talking about the dust? And the number of times that something's come up, and the astronomer's like, oh, we don't know what it is. What is it? And I'm just like, yeah, it's dust. And then about four months later, they come out and they're like, no, oh, yeah, it was dust. I'm glad you're our champion fighting for us. Eddie. Oh yeah, definitely. So these these guys listen to also astronomy regularly. They're they're well versed in the importance of dust. Um, but why, why don't you remind us, for some of our new listeners, um, why you were looking for dust and why studying dust is so important? Right. Um, yeah, so there is a lot of context that goes into this. Um, so dust in the astrophysical sense, it, it only makes up about 1% of the mass of the, the material between stars, the interstellar medium but it has a really crucial role in the chemistry and the evolution of galaxies mm -hmm. because it's it's very very hard to form stars without some uh, you know some of this dust to help cool the gas down enough so that it can condense uh, to, to form stars for example um, it it's uh, this dust provides a site for uh, water molecules to, to form out in space and and uh, molecular hydrogen h2 it's very hard for two uh, random hydrogen atoms to slam together and stick and make one hydro molecular hydrogen atom. 
but if you have a little bit of this dust, the chemistry is right so that these two independent hydrogen atoms can come and make a hydrogen molecule. And the hydrogen molecules are what go on to form stars, not the not yes. singular atoms. So um, it's very important in that sense. It, it, it provides a place for, for this to form, uh, for example. So there's a lot of reasons why dust is important. But uh, th there was kind of a crisis. It was actually called the dust budget crisis, mm -hmm. where when we looked back to galaxies at high redshift, so, so basically seeing light from an earlier stage in the universe, when, when these galaxies were an earlier stage in their life, we, we could see that there was a lot of dust in the galaxies, just from, for, directly from the light we saw. And when people ran through the, the, the models of uh, trying to say, okay, how much dust must have been produced from various sources, yeah. they found to that... To sort of account for the light that they can see. Exactly, accounting for, for the light they could see from the dust. Mm -hmm. They had a really hard time uh, coming up with enough dust just based on what kind of the assumed sources and the assumed amounts were back uh, you know, 10, 20 years ago. Yeah. Uh, so it used to be assumed that most of the, or uh, much of the dust anyway was produced in the outer layers of AGB stars. So, so it kind of evolved low and intermediate mass stars. Yeah. Um, but it turns out that wasn't quite enough to, to uh, make all the dust yeah, that we saw back then because those yeah. low intermediate mass stars, in order to get to that stage where they become the puffed up AGB stars, takes mm. you know billions of years yes of course yeah because they're, because they're smaller they're cooler they're much longer lived because they're burning through their fuel less quickly exactly so we saw that you know there are some galaxies uh, there was even a few years ago some people uh, uh, detected a significant amount of dust in in galaxies back at redshift 7.5 wow. so uh, you know really quite uh, early on in the universe mm -hmm. so you need a much quicker process to, to you know deliver a, a, a relatively significant amount of dust you know kind of yeah, early on. Yeah because there hasn't been enough time for these AGB stars to go through their long life cycles and then produce the dust in the way that you know we know that those stars produce dust. Yeah exactly. Uh, so one of the ideas that people had for this is that maybe supernovas can help with this mm. and, and people knew for a long time that supernovas should produce some dust yes. but up until okay. let's say something like 10 years ago uh, people thought most people thought that supernovas only produced a very small amount of dust. Right. And that actually has a lot to do with supernova 1987A because yeah. before supernova 1987A there weren't any supernovas uh, recent young supernovas close enough where you could study how much dust um, in in great de in great detail you couldn't study how much dust was directly produced by them. You had to look at much farther away supernovas that you could not resolve. Um, and you could do you know some statistical studies and, and, and inference of, of it, but when you directly measured the amount of dust that you could see from in the mid infrared part of the spectrum mm. for supernova 1987A, uh, very early on, they saw that it was only producing you know one thousandth or something like that, or one ten one ten thousandth of a, of a solar mass of dust. Oh wow, so that's tiny. It was tiny. But uh, so, so many people thought, okay, well, supernovas don't really produce much dust. That, that's mm. you know they can't really do much there. Uh, but then people started to realize, well, hold on just a moment. Uh, the supernova is really, really young. Yeah. And, you know, just a few years after it's exploded, the temperatures are still quite high. Um, yeah, and of they course, the dust time is, so for... cold, is so cold that you need it to be cooler mm -hmm. for you to have this dust forming, right? Yep, yeah, exactly. And it just maybe hasn't had time for the, the uh, atoms and molecules to run into each other and form the dust grain, you know, so on and yeah. so forth. So uh, we've gone back to monitoring it, and uh, just a few years ago, some of the other researchers who worked in this research group uh, with me on this paper released a somewhat surprising result that in the new, more recent observations with the Herschel Space Telescope, yeah. when they went back and looked um, in t uh, 2012 and then again in 2015, they were finding that now at that later stage, you know, just a little less than 30 years later, the temperatures were cooled down uh, to about uh, 20 something Kelvin, about 25 Kelvin. Okay, like so that. now we're getting into the regime of dust. Yep, now we're getting into the regime of dust. Exactly. Temperatures that we would want. Yep, and they found that with these new measurements at this later stage, they were finding much higher masses of almost one solar mass, oh, almost wow. a mass you know equivalent to the mass of our sun yeah. in dust. Just in dust. Just in dust. Just like you can imagine, like a whole sun just made of dust. Exactly. Yeah. So that's. You know, it, that was somewhat contentious because it was so much larger than uh, the previous earlier studies. Of course, of course. But they didn't know about this uh, uh, part of, the, they couldn't do this measurement before, because before Herschel, that part of the spectrum, the far infrared, 
uh, uh, was not easily observable from Earth. You have to go into space because the water vapor, especially, and other things in the Earth's atmosphere absorb most of the light mm. in that part of the spectrum. So you really need to have a, a facility like Herschel in order yeah. to measure it and, and do your analysis. So is that why you were looking at 1987A? Were you looking to measure the amount of dust or were you trying to figure out something else about the supernova remnant? Yes. Uh, the, the answer is multiple things, but... Uh, always for, is. It always <laughs> is. For my involvement in, in the project, I was interested in, in refining the measurements of the dust. Yes. So um, Herschel was wonderful in, in that we could finally see at several points of the spectrum we could measure the light and, and infer that it had a solar mass of dust. But it, the resolution was not very good. It was much poorer than the Hubble Space Telescope, for example. Yeah. But, but now, since then, the ALMA telescope has come online. It, uh, uh, like I said, it's the array of 66 uh, dishes. But at the time that we did the observations for, for this, it didn't have all the dishes yet. So the resolution wasn't as good as it now currently is. But um, it is still much, much better, uh, you know, leagues better than, than the... Than um, Herschel, than Herschel yeah, was, of yeah. course. So we wanted to study what the distribution of dust looks like in the center of it because now oh you can get all those fine details because you've got the better resolution from alma so exactly. you can look at things right alma is an interferometer so you can you know place antennas uh, very far away you know many uh, tens of kilometers away yeah. and what what happens is when you use the supercomputer to combine all the signals you can basically recover an image with the sharpness of detail the resolution of a single telescope that would have that uh, diameter, that width. Which is absolutely incredible yeah, technology. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. Yeah, so that was uh, kind of the thinking behind this. You can do some other things as well with ALMA because uh, with some telescopes like Herschel, you're kind of limited to either doing what we call photometry, where you're just measuring up all the light in a certain wave band, mm -hmm. or you can do spectroscopy in, in a different mode where you can actually measure the spectrum, but you know, give up some other things. With ALMA, you basically get everything at once. Oh, wow. Um, you get uh, very high resolution images at many different wavelengths. Uh, so you can actually do spectroscopy and photometry kind of at the same time. Oh my gosh, it's like an amazing two for one. Yes, it was wonderful. Uh, <laughs> it's frustrating too, because it's a lot of complex data to process. But, of course, um, yeah. And there, there were many challenges just because because the, the kind of conditions you're observing in the supernova are uh, quite extreme. Um, for example, what the, the dust in this uh, in the heart of the, the supernova, what we call the ejecta, because it's the stuff that was ejected from the it, basically the outer layers of the star that for exploded. For once, astronomers are naming things sensibly and correctly, which almost never happens. Oh, don't don't worry. We'll get back to very obscure naming very. <laughs> uh, um, yeah. So, so th this ejecta, it's moving extremely fast. Um, there, there's a very, very fast part at the outer edges that goes something like 10,000 kilometers a second, I, I believe, if I remember wow. my numbers right. But the main ejecta are traveling at something like 2,000 kilometers per second. Because, like I said, this is an extremely large energetic explosion. So it yeah. just expels all that material, that uh, several solar masses of material, out from the star at very high speeds. 2,000 kilometers a second. Right. So to put that in perspective, um, that's about 8,000 times faster than your average jumbo jet. <laughs> and uh, this is nice. If Usain Bolt could run at the speed of the ejecta in Supernova 1987A, he could run the 100-meter dash in 50 microseconds. Oh, my gosh. I just, you can't even imagine that, can you? 15 microseconds. I mean, you literally blink and you would miss it, right? Yeah, <laughs> like, literally, you would. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it's an uh, extremely challenging data set, but was rich with all kinds of goodies. It was... Uh, Really so exciting. what did you find about the distribution of the dust? Because that's what you were looking for, right? Yes, yes. Originally, the, um, uh, like I said, we, we get much of the spectrum f from one set of observations. So other people on the team were really focusing on the molecular side of things. So we can actually see molecules forming in the supernova ejecta, wow. which is something that you know people didn't really know if it was going to be possible or not this yes. short after the explosion. Mm. Um, uh, so we see that, and, and other people were, were initially in charge of doing that and, and uh, uh, have published papers already on that as well. Uh, my job was uh, mainly just to look at only the dust, but we find out uh, pretty early on that actually it's, has a, it, it's related to the molecules. The emission we see from the dust yeah. is actually has this kind of complex interplay between the emission you see from the, mo the molecules. Um, so we had to you kind of combine those efforts a little bit. But yeah, we saw that uh, the dust is kind of clumpy. It's not a smooth, uniform distribution. It's not just a single ball of dust. Okay, you know, yeah. As you can imagine, uh, it, it's, the, the explosion is quite complex. 
uh, uh, you get little clumps of material that, that you know might condense over here and over there, but you know a little bit less in between. So yeah, that makes sense. Yep. I mean, that's kind of it's almost like a nice symmetry where if you look out into space and you've got you know like a galaxy here and a galaxy there, mm. then you know not a lot going on necessarily mm-hmm. in between those galaxies. And I guess it's a similar sort of symmetry, just on a completely different scale. Right? Yes, yeah, exactly. And you know you do see some emission in between and stuff, but uh, just with the resolution we have, uh, yeah. uh, uh, it does look clumpy. At least. We can say yeah. that much. Which at least. you know makes sense. Yeah. You, I guess you'd be surprised if everything was perfect and, and uniform because nature is not like that. Yes, right? exactly. And and we kind of suspected it would be non-uniform anyway because people have studied uh, the light in other parts of the spectrum in supernova 1987A and they know that it, it probably had an asymmetric explosion anyway as well. Okay. So the stuff is not just expanding spherically, you know, they, they yeah. knew that some of it must be shot out at preferential angles or something like that. So so we kind of expected it to be a bit weird, but now we have the first resolved images mm. of the dust in emission in, in the supernova. Um, so once we were able to do that and, and be very careful with how we processed and cleaned up the data, uh, then we could fit our functions uh, uh, to the data to see how much dust is in in the ejecta of the supernova. Now, you know, this is a, a couple of years after that previous study with Herschel that said there's yes. about a solar, ma- uh, you know, kind of 0. 0. 0.4 to 0. 0.7 solar masses yeah. um, at that time. So we could refine our models and say, yeah. uh, you know, how much is there now? Uh, yeah. Now that we see it with a little bit higher resolution, we can maybe even try to pinpoint, you know, where some, is some, it from yeah. and things like that. Yeah, exactly. Um, you can't do a full three-dimensional uh, study of the dust because, unfortunately, uh, dust emits in what we call a continuum. It doesn't have distinct emission line peaks like like the uh, molecular line transitions have. Uh, so you can't get the redshift information like you can from some other tracers. But yes, of course. Um, but you can get the spatial inform the two-dimensional projected spatial information. Mm-hmm. So we were able to study how much mass of dust we see there. And we were actually also able to talk a little bit about the type of dust, like wh- what the composition of the dust mm. is. I scoured so many uh, you know, research websites and papers and databases mm. trying to find the actual uh, models of how dust emits in that part of the spectrum. People have measured this in the lab, or they've you know done careful studies of looking at different parts of the sky, you know, in the Milky Way, yes, uh, and said, okay. okay, dust that is made up of carbon, such as like graphite or something like that, has a very different emission profile than dust that's made up of what we call silicates, forsterite, olivines, things like this, things okay. that the Earth is made of. Those have a, a very different emission profile. Yet again, so. I amassed, I think in the end it was something like 150, 180 different oh models God. of these. Yeah. And, um, so once all that was done, you know, then we could really get our hands dirty and see what you know, the data can tell us now when we apply all these different models to it. Not only that, but we also had the idea, let's look at some theory papers, or, or some simulation papers rather, from you know, the last couple decades. People have made tables of what they think a certain mass of stars should produce in a supernova explosion. So when they go through, they make a simulation basically of of the supernova explosion, and then they count up all the bits of say and say, okay, how much oxygen should there be at the end of, of all this yeah, in, for okay. a star of this mass and yes. this metallicity? How much carbon should there be? How much uh, uh, iron should there be okay, in the different yeah. isotopes and everything like that? So uh, we got several of those tables and just did a little bit of accounting, adding up the bits, yeah. um, just to say what are actual limits that we can place from these from these uh, simulations on what we kind of expect. So, for example, one of the, if you're looking at amorphous carbon type dust, which is basically kind of like little bits of carbon that, that aren't necessarily in a nice, you know, crystalline structure, but maybe you're just kind of like little globs uh, pieced together. Like fluffy little bits yeah. of dust. Yeah, basically think like soot or, or something that you get, you know, from char- from burning. Uh, those are basically made up of purely carbon atoms. So if you know how much carbon uh, your star should have made from one of these tables, you can say, okay, well, it should probably be less than that. I mean, the tables yeah, themselves, are, they're, not, they're not exactly precise. They're just kind no, of... No, but it gives you an idea, at least. Exactly. You can say, at least order of magnitude, okay, this star, f- for the one we found, carbon, it, only, it was only predicted to, uh, for a star like that to have about 0.14 solar masses of carbon. So we say any models that say you have, let's say, 0.5 solar masses, you can, you can those. pretty much say, okay, well, well, we can't have that much dust in carbon. Maybe some of it, you know, up to yeah. maybe that limit could be. But um, then, you know, we're still not even taking into consideration any of, you know, chemistry that you would need, you know, the right conditions you would need on the time scales to, to produce mm-hmm. that much dust. So you're just saying, really, that's kind of a limit. So adding up all those bits, 
and saying how much of these how much of this material uh, how much of this of these elements do we expect there to be and then fitting the dust masses you can kind of put together a master picture of what the dust in the supernova mm. uh, you know should kind of look like so our new results fr from this new epoch this new era um, resolving the dust with Alma agree very well with the previous results from the Herschel. We, we still say that there's probably about, you know, kind of 0.4 solar masses of dust. Yeah. It's, but it's probably a mixture of the carbonaceous dust, the, so dust made from carbon grains, so whether that's graphite or, or these amorphous carbon, which is probably more likely, or uh, uh, so a mixture of that and the silicate varieties, mm -hmm. um, like forced direct enstatite or, or whatever your, your preferred variety is. We don't, <laughs> we, we don't have the, the means to test, you know, specifically which of those it is. Of course, um, yeah. Because the, the, the emission profiles look very similar. Yeah, um, and you just don't have the detail that you would need to be able to figure out and distinguish between. Yes, ex that's exactly right. But at least, you know, we're, we're taking steps toward refining mm -hmm. our understanding of what should be there. Um, so that was kind of the main idea for the project for me going into it, you know, to do these type of things. Yes. And then, of course, any time you do a research paper... <laughs> it always changes. It always changes. Uh, you know, you go to a conference, you talk to your, your colleagues, you get some feedback and, and you know, have some discussions and realize, oh, we can actually do this thing now, too. And, yeah. uh, you know, then you have to go back and reprocess the data a little bit and things like this. But after some discussions with our colleagues, when, when we were sending around drafts of the paper before submitting it to the journal, we were looking at the highest resolution image of the dust where we actually could see, you know, the different, the, the clumpy nature of the dust. And um, we'd noticed, you know, from very early on that there was this little patch of dust in the center uh, mm. that was a little bit brighter than its surroundings. So we could see, you know, dust emission basically throughout the, the ejecta. But, but there it was happened. this bright bit right in the middle. Yep. So because we're, as you were saying, we're very original with naming, we, uh, we called it the blob. Uh, just in emails, right? <laughs> you say that. However, the remake of the film The Blob happened a year after 1987A. So maybe subconsciously, uh -huh. there was something going on somewhere. I knew no, there no. was a reason something was speaking yeah. to me. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, we just kind of, just to have something to call it in emails, right? We just started mm. calling, oh, there's this little blob over here. Uh, and that name kind of stuck because I, I really enjoy it. But. Yeah, no, it's good. It's always fun when you can just like stick something silly in there. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so after talking with some of our, our collaborators, uh, who were you know, authors on the paper, they, uh, we, we realized that we can actually you know, maybe say something about this, uh, do some calculations, do a little bit of modeling. And uh, we realized that uh, we could probably attribute a temperature to this thing. First, we, we did some tests. Uh, what does it do to? It's most likely do, uh, being heated up, so it's a bit warmer than its surroundings. Yeah. Uh, then we had to decide, or then we had to, to try to figure out what is causing the heating. Uh, there were two main options that we tested. Uh, the first one is uh, radioactive 44 titanium decaying uh, because it's produced in quite large quantities during the explosion and then over time it slowly decays. Uh, I think it has a half-life of something like 80 years uh, on, that, on that order. Okay, so there would still be a lot of it around There would still be point. a lot of it around, yep. Um, but you expect it to be not you know, uniformly distributed, but you don't expect there to be a, a very high concentration in yeah. just one small part of it, right? Yeah, that does seem strange. Yeah. So we can't completely rule it out yet, but we think that's a much less likely explanation. Yeah. The, the more likely explanation, totally. just because of looking at the, the geometry, it's this really small region right in the center, and it happens to line up exactly where the leftover remnants, the compact object, uh, uh, the neutron star, uh, is expected to be. So we, we tested if this is due to, to uh, the neutron star uh, that we think should be left over after, after the explosion, uh, how much heating should this, this, uh, this neutron star be giving off to, to mm. heat it up? And when we, we ran the calculations, it, it turned out to be about uh, something like 10 Kelvin uh, of extra heating that, that was being provided by this neutron star. Okay, yeah. yeah. Um, so we think that's the most likely explanation, uh, is that the neutron star inside, the neutron star that was left over after the, the explosion, uh, is, is heating up this little patch of gas hotter right, than its surroundings. Right, making it glow brighter. So I guess now you've got a little bit of evidence to say that, yes, it is a neutron star mm -hmm. in the middle. Because, of course, you can't see it because that right. dust is in the way. Yep, exactly. The, the dust is still there. It's still, uh, uh, there's also, you know, molecular gas uh, that's still in the way. So, uh, yeah, you can't see any direct light from it. 
uh, we're hoping, you know, m maybe in, in 100 years, it's, any, it's a guessing game, no one really knows how long it will take for the dust to clear out enough for you to see direct light from it, but we'll, we'll definitely be observing this thing for, for a long time yeah, to come, right? Yeah, of course. Um, how do you know it's a neutral star and not a black hole, right? right? Because when these stars go supernovae, they can leave behind a black hole, they can leave behind a neutron star. How do you know it's definitely not a black hole, or is it... Maybe a black hole. Yeah, it, it could maybe be a black hole. So far, most people think that it is a neutron star. Um, the, the reasoning is that anything sm smaller than the star that exploded originally should have become a white dwarf. So things like our, our sun's uh, size will, will end their, their lives as a white dwarf. Mm -hmm. it, it takes a star that's something like 8 to 10 solar masses to uh, create a neutron star. Okay. Just because you need a really large amount of gravity to compress the material in the core enough to to take the the protons and electrons and smash them to create uh, to create neutrons yes okay um, so you need a sufficient mass to make th that that next stage to get to a neutron star now again in order to make a black hole you need yet again a much more massive initial star to be able uh, to compress okay. all the stuff down and trap everything in its own gravitational well yes. that nothing can escape from yeah. um, so in our current understanding of how we think these things work you probably need a mass uh, an initial star with a mass of something like uh, twice the mass that we see for this star so you probably need okay. something like a 25 30 solar mass star initially and we think this star that exploded to become 19 supernova 1987a is probably was probably at the time it exploded about 14 solar masses okay so the the star was just simply not big enough to right. make a black hole right now that doesn't mean that it couldn't form a black hole at all there has been some research on this and one thing that could happen or could have happened is that after the initial explosion just because it's very chaotic it's very complex you could have some mass fallback from some of the ejecta and if it hit it in the right way you know uh, and contributed enough mass to it in the right conditions it could have then formed a black hole later after the initial explosion mm. but again we, we haven't seen uh, any direct evidence of that yet because these are the first resolved images of uh, the interior yeah. of the ejecta i mean the hubble space telescope was able to resolve the optical light but the the obviously the dust the and dust, gas is yeah. absorbing that uh, light on the interior yeah um, it's not the first thing that we've detected from the compact source because uh, one of the ways that you know a supernova has happened is that you uh, you get a big influx of neutrinos from the source. Uh. So just earlier I mentioned the way that you make the neutron star is you have these protons and electrons that make up the normal matter in the center of the, the, the core of the initial star. If you press it hard enough, the protons and electrons will combine to make a neutrino, or mm -hmm. sorry, to make a neutron. Mm -hmm. And part of that process, you also release neutrinos. Ah, it's another type okay. of fundamental particle. So you get this massive you know, outburst of neutrinos at the time that the core of the star collapses initially. Okay. So that was technically you know, the first actual direct detection of something from the collapse okay, of, of, yeah. that would have become the neutron star. Uh, and that would last you know, for a few seconds. Yeah, yeah not <laughs> very long at all. In 1987. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, but since that time, we haven't directly uh, detected anything from the, 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 the compact source in the center. So this is really cool that by looking at a much longer wavelength, mm -hmm. you're looking at the dust and then suddenly you're getting evidence of there being something hidden behind there that, you know, no one can see. That's exactly it, yeah. And I think that is really, really awesome. And this is why dust is cool, and I say this nearly every episode, <laughs> because everyone, you know, is all about the optical, but we always say, no, there's so much of the hidden universe going on that you can't see. Absolutely. Until you start looking at the dust. So this is amazing that, you know, you've now got even more evidence that there is a neutron star and you can pinpoint its location because of this dust. Mm -hmm. And you've narrowed down how much dust you think is in supernovae, which I guess going back to your point right at the beginning about the dust budget crisis, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's helping to resolve that. So mm -hmm. winning all around. Winning all around, yeah. It doesn't completely solve the problem for all the galaxies, but no. um, with the kind of masses that we're seeing here, it, it can solve the problem for like 20% of the galaxies when they were studying this a few years ago. If you use these production rates, then yeah. that, that can solve the, the problem completely outright uh, for, for about a fifth of the galaxies they saw at that time. Uh, you still need some other stuff to get you know, up to uh, the limit for some of them. So maybe uh, you need to adjust your model rates for, for how much dust can condense, it can uh, grow in the interstellar medium. But you know, this is still 
uh, an area of research that we're going to continue to to monitor. Yeah, of course, but you can't solve everything at once, Phil. You've I know, I know. Try as I might. Else. Yes, you have to sleep at some point. Yeah. <laughs> um, so one of the the things that that we're still very interested in in seeing and monitoring, um, especially with supernova nineteen eighty seven a, is that obviously this. We're seeing the dust that's formed now 30 years after the explosion of the star. But anyone who's seen the beautiful Hubble picture of it, there's this distinct ring around um, mm. the, the central ejecta. And that's actually from mass that the star kind of puffed off in a little event uh, before, about 40,000 years before the supernova explosion. So what is happening is that this the ejecta as it expands into space at some point will will reach that material that's already out there and hit it and create what we call a shock and that will create a shock wave that will propagate back into the, the dust so it's like a reflecting wave if you've ever seen water come up to the edge of a pool or something oh, and you see yeah. it go back is yeah. something similar to that and that reverse shock wave could actually destroy a lot of the dust People are arguing, oh. uh, you know, this depends a lot on the actual conditions of the specific object you're looking at, because if the star doesn't have, you know, one of these rings or a significant amount of material to make this reverse shock wave, yeah. maybe it doesn't matter. Like the Crab Nebula is basically just expanding into free space with very little material that it's running into. Um, yeah. But in this case, you know, there might possibly be a reverse shock that could destroy it. But um, recently, um, some people have done, you know, some more study on this and say that, well, with the size of the grains that you kind of expect, uh, most of the dust should probably survive, we think. Okay. Also, I was lucky enough to fly on Sophia. <gasps> um, Sophia, for our listeners who who have not heard of Sophia, Sophia is a telescope on an aeroplane, and I don't think you can get cooler than that, really. It's ridiculous. It's amazing. <laughs> it, it's so much fun, yeah. And uh, the benefit of that is because Sophia also observes in the far infrared mm. part and the mid infrared part of the spectrum. Uh, again, you need to get above as much of the atmosphere as you can to observe it, to, to do these observations because the atmosphere absorbs most of the light in that part of the spectrum. Um, so for that project, we were again observing supernova 1987A, but we were observing um, that ring I just mentioned mm. that's around it. So not the stuff that's ex expanding from the explosion, but the material that was puffed off uh, mm. about 40,000 years before the explosion. We know that there is dust in that ring uh, from earlier generations of uh, you know stellar activity, um, and that was being heated up by the initial shockwave blast. So when the the supernova explosion happens, obviously there's some material at the very outer edge that is going. Uh, th I think I said about ten thousand kilometers, mm. percent, something like that, and that will shake things up, you know, very violently and heat it up to very high temperature, and that will excite all the dust and stuff that's in that ring already. So that uh, dust now is at a much warmer temperature, which emits in the mid infrared part of mm. the spectrum. So we were we were studying that dust, and uh, they, it had been monitored a couple times, uh, you know, over several years as well. And we found that ring brightness had increased over the last five-ish years oh. since we observed it before. So the idea, the interpretation there is that the dust after the initial shock wave went through the ring. Mm. It, it destroyed a lot of the dust grains, you know, because they might not be solid like rocks like on the earth, you know, they might yeah. just be kind of uh, loose conglomerations of, of, you know, powdery type stuff. So the, the shockwave could have destroyed some of that dust in the ring. But even just a few years after that, when we went back and monitored it uh, in 2017 with Sophia, we saw that it, the, the brightness of the ring increased significantly. Uh, uh, and it followed the, the thermal, uh, we think it followed the thermal uh, dust emission profile. Um, mm. So the interpretation we're, we're, see, we're uh, using there is that the dust probably reformed only just oh, a few years after it was after it was destroyed. Oh. So even if the dust gets destroyed in the ejecta, there's a possibility it could reform on a very short time scale. All right, so you might be okay in the end after all. Exactly. Yeah. So we, we really need to go back and look at it some more. You know, we need to keep monitoring this. You know, year to year to see what's going on. Perfect excuse to keep you in a job. Exactly. Well, no one can complain. <laughs> I think we'll leave it there, Phil, because that was brilliant, very comprehensive, and a lot more detail than you'll ever find on those news articles on, like, BBC or whatever, so, yeah. They're great, but, you know, you can't have a nice, long conversation. No, exactly, and you can get all the ins and outs and everything, which yeah. is why people listen to Awesome Astronomy. Yes. So, thank you very much, Phil. Thanks, Jen. Well, that's all we've got time for this month. 
almost all we have time for this year, but as long-time listeners will know, we always like to drop a little stink bomb down your chimney on Christmas Day and ram something hard and foul into your stocking. <laughs> this year will be no exception. If you like the show, send us an email at the show at awesomeastronomy.com. If you're on social media, come and say hi. And get the cogs turning. Start thinking about what you like, what you don't like, what you miss that we got rid of from before, what you want shortened, what you want lengthened. Just drop us an email with your thoughts to the show at awesomeastronomy.com. We'll have a think about it over a mince pie and a glass of sherry. But until Christmas morning, it's goodbye from Cydonia Base. Awesome Astronomy is produced at Orbital Sound Limited by Ralph, Paul, Jenny, John and Damien and is free to use and distribute with attribution. We promote general science, astronomy, space science and rational thinking with more resources on our website at awesomeastronomy.com. If you want us to read your comments out on the show, send us your views, opinions, questions or critiques to the show at awesomeastronomy.com. Tweet us at awesomeastropod.com or give the Awesome Astronomy Facebook page a like and leave your comments there. Thanks for listening, and from Cydonia Base, end of transmission.